I wanted to talk about something which is not really directly technical. It's not PowerShell. My last session yesterday was purely you know, showing the shell and PowerShell stuff. Uh, this one is not about that. It's about you know, everything else, the soft skills with big quotes. It's not soft, but it's non-coding skills. And um, you probably have experienced that doing the automation and doing, you know, creating a solution is fine, but does it create value? What is value? What's the point of doing the automation? And then think about, okay, does it, have, does it have the impact that you want it to have? And then you realize sometimes you create something which is maybe the best solution that these companies have seen, but maybe they don't see it. Why do you need to prove the value you create? Why do you need to, uh, you know, work extra efforts to say, well, we've created something for you, you have to use it. So on the menu today, we want to say, you know, why the tech is the easy part? It's not always, but uh, it's not because you've managed the technology, you've managed implementing something that doesn't mean you have the impact you want to have. So we are technologists, so what? You know, what do we need to know, what do we need to understand? And um, we need to engineer the change. It's not just about the technology, it's about the change we're doing um, when we want to implement something. And what's the ultimate goal? It's good to understand the task you have to do today, but then how do you read the bigger picture for you, for your team, for the business you work with? So what's the tech role that we have asked to do within the business? Why is there a role you know, in this company for me to do you know, PowerShell or some other stuff? And when we, can, when we want to think about those things, there's a few models that really help, at least helped me a lot, uh, finding you know, what's the purpose of the role I was in and how can I be more efficient within our role, because it's not just about the technology. So how do you think about the problem you have? How do you try to uh, write it down, to improve it over time? And, um, and then with this help, um, you can be a better technologist, better experts in what you're doing. So who am I? I'm Gail, you probably have seen me before, so I'm not gonna spend much time on this. But um, we are automators, we automate things. That's why we're in the PowerShell conference. Uh, we love automations usually using PowerShell, but we use a lot of technologies, a lot of different services. We design, architect, and implement automated solutions. We are solution developers. So even if you're not writing any code, you're just using different services, you put them together, you're still developing a solution, right? So even not getting into the, are you a developer, are you a programmer, that's another problem, but you develop a solution. And that's really important. we developers, so we need to apply a development mindset, we develop some solutions, so we need to think about it that way. And there's methodologies and tools that exist for that. It's not just about programming, it's about developing. And Scrum or the Agile processes is one of them. We craft technical solutions from knowledge. And you've seen with April, and you've seen as well maybe in the previous sessions, we, uh, we're not repeating the same process over and over again. We're not just pushing the same button every, every time the same thing. Even if you use the mouse to automate something, you know where to click, or at least you know where to find the knowledge, learn the knowledge, and then you need to craft something together. So we're crafting, we are knowledge workers. This is very important when you try to understand the motivation between the tasks and how you can motivate people. If you just have you know, stick and carrot, that doesn't work for knowledge workers. There's better ways of, of motivating people, so bear that in mind. And sometimes we're just doing things because we're told to. And sometimes that's okay. The problem is if you're only doing things tasks because you have a ticket coming in, you're doing the ticket, you go to the next ticket, you know, what are, what are you creating? What value are you providing? Do you know? Do you know where the ticket falls? Do you know how to make decisions between two tickets? Which one should you do first? Is it just, you know, first in, first out? So, you know, you need to, have, you need to be able to have some um, understanding of what's the bigger picture, so then you can find which one to do. And finally, just for fun, uh, with the experts. I don't know if you know this one. Um, if you've seen, I really recommend on YouTube looking at uh, this comedy sketch, it's like yeah, seven minutes or so, and it's really fun because that's all of us. When we ask to do something, and it never goes, never, you know, with the experts. So with the experts, so what? We know the technology, we know what to do with the technology, how to build it together, but the best solution 
does not guarantee success. And we know of very, very good products, probably the best, you know, we believe, or I believe at least, some of them were the best, you know, successful products with the right technology, but that doesn't mean they were successful. We are introducing a change, so a change of behavior, and that behavior and that change needs adoption. And that's usually very difficult, and when we think about creating a new product, or we're creating a new solution, a new automation system, um, we don't really think about the, the change of the adoption that needs to happen around that product. So success is not only creating the right solution, but it's also how that solution is used. And that's very, very important. And that's an example of a Windows phone, which was a very good product, but <laughs> didn't work at all. So you can write, you can create the best solution. That doesn't mean that's going to work. And in this case, um, you know, good software, oh, sorry, a good, good software in its own, good phone, like the devices were good, but the services and the experience was not, were not good because of the apps and those problems. You can have the same thing where you have the best automation. You know, if you not, if you not, someone cannot find where your automation is or how to access it or how to, to interface with it, you're not going to get great success with adoption. So what we build for our users. So sometimes we design solutions and we're thinking, okay, we need to create a solution and we think technology. So we build those things. Oh yeah, we created a great solution for you and it's using Azure, it's using PowerShell, I said policy, you know, there's a lot of those things, technical terms, buzzwords. For us, it's great. We're technologists. We understand all of these things because we can exchange, we can compare, we can see, you know, the purpose. But what about the users? Do the users understand this? And frankly, do they care? So it's all about the business value. But what is the biz business value? The business value is whatever the business finds valuable. Very helpful, right? <laughs> <laughs> but actually, that, that's what it's about. Um, you don't have one business value which is universal for everyone. It depends on your business, what's the line of business, and all of those things. And that's what you need to understand to understand why you exist in your organization. It's not the script that you wrote. That's not business value, at least 99% of the time. Maybe it is, is your sole job is to create a script and sell it to a, a customer. Maybe that's the value your company expects. But usually when you're doing automation, that's not where the, the value is. That's not where the business value is. There's some other things that needs to happen for the, to be valuable to your business. And if you don't, understand and have a clear understanding of where that comes from or where that goes, it's going to be very hard for you to optimize the work you're doing. You know, having the right priorities for the tickets you, or the, the <coughs> projects you're working on. So hopefully it's what the customer needs and wants. And I already scrapped the wants because they never know what they want. They tell you something and it's never what you deliver. So remember that you say the customer wants something, it doesn't really matter. You guess what the problem they have, you try to answer it, and they will tell you, no, that's not why I want. Which is good, because then you can work something else and try again. But the key is, don't spend three months or six months trying to do something for them, and then say, hey, I've done it, it's perfect, it's for you, and then they tell you, no, that's not what I meant. Do something quick, you know, what we call an MVP, most, uh, you know, most valuable product, minimum value, valuable product, something tiny, Something that you can say, hey, did you mean this type of improvement? Even if it's just a mock or something very quick and it takes you half a day and they say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. So then, so then you can dig further. And then you do very tiny increments up until they say, oh, yeah, I can use that. And this is one way to start the adoption process. You involve them early enough. You don't go underground for weeks or months. You try to validate what the problem is first. So the other thing is, um, those who put you in the position think that you can help creating value. That doesn't mean you create direct value to the business, but all in all, within your teams, your organization, your department, whatever, maybe you will be able to create some value. So when you try to understand you know, how you can help creating the value, don't look at the tasks or the technology because you might miss the opportunities. If you if you see the end goal, the purpose, you will see, oh, actually, you don't need that solution. You just need to do this. So you can bypass all this new software that they wanted to purchase directly to go 
to the solution they need. And look at what help you are providing. What is the mission? The mission, the goal, the purpose of maybe your team or, or maybe your, your role. If you want to learn a bit more about business value, I really recommend this uh, book from uh, Mark Schwartz, which is The Art of Business Value. It's quite, quite fun and very easy to read, and that goes into more details. But the key is, you know, what business value, whatever the business finds valuable, whether it's getting money, it depends who's the business, how do you define the business, that doesn't really matter, but you need to understand <coughs> what's the business value, the ultimate goal, maybe it's selling something to customers, but then, you know, how does that affect you? So that's also where we are going to start uh, diving into. Also, you know, I hear quite often, yes, but I'm a tech, I'm only internally facing, I'm not directly communicating to customers, so that doesn't really apply to me. I'm not directly uh, communicating to customers, so, it, you know, I do something different. Well, you don't create value directly to the customer if you're not selling to them, but you're part of a bigger system, which it's, the, f the goal is to create value. If a company exists, it's to create value to answer a need that someone has, and that's their reason to exist, whether it's commercial or not commercial. Nonprofit also have you know, defined value in some ways, which is probably not the money, but the service they're giving to a community or to something else. So the key element there, and I will put you know, the red boxes when it's quite important, key elements, business value, always keep that in mind. And be focused, extremely focused on the business value. The mission and the purpose of your organization on different layers is very important. For you, maybe your role, if you have a, a role which is uh, unique, in your team, maybe the one of your team and the one of your department and so on. And uh, it all starts with a problem or a need. There's always something <coughs> that, okay, I have this problem, so I need to find a way to make it simpler or ask someone or buy a product or do something. So Bob needs his PC fixed. If Bob does not work in the company, fixing his PC may not provide any value for the company. So maybe that's not the job to fix, you know, a random guy's computer. But if Bob works here, it will help him getting back to work. So he will be more productive. And maybe he's directly selling to customers, so directly creating value. So there's a relationship between the work you're doing and, you know, how you can help Bob, you know, getting back to work and create the value. So there's still a relationship. It's not direct. It's not customer facing, but you're still providing value. I'll take another example, and then we will run with that one. Uh, throughout the presentation, uh, something that we probably relate a bit more. So Sarah needs 28 VMs provisioned and configured so that she can run a Teams, uh, an accounting product, which is a SaaS. Uh, so software as a service, it's just a website, you know, and you do accounting. You can think of any big accounting software that run on the web, that's the, that's the ID. And then she's got a very specific niche, I just want 28 VMs and um, sold to the company's customers. So the, the, the accounting product is sold to the customer. So she's creating something and managing a software which is sold to the end customer. She has a need. We, let's say we are the platform team. We were to create and maintain the VMs, the, the images at least, um, the bicep templates to be able to spin them up on Azure, uh, all the artifacts, we saw DSC as an example to manage configuration. That could be the thing that we're doing as a platform team. We also use, in this example, Azure Policy Guest Configuration. This is a product placement, you see. Um, we also use Guest Configuration to ensure we create VMs. They stay in the same position. We're also compliant with governance and things like that. So let's define, we see, let's define the, the platform team. Uh, Sarah's the customer of the platform team. Even if she's internal, even if we don't call that necessarily a customer, it's still the customer because she has a need and we're providing that need, all right? We need to create some artifacts. So we sell PowerShell scripts, maybe one artifact, if they need to use that script. It's something that is unique that we create for them and they can use. Uh, it could be bicep modules, images. I would say that's kind of part of the product that the platform team provides to them. But the product is not enough. So we have some services that the team is building. The services are you know, your experience in general. For instance, how do you discover all the things they can do that we built for them. You know, Azure already has a lot of things. Why would they go through the internal team to find a PowerShell script or to find uh, maybe an image or some automation processes? 
Well, we need to present that to them and we need to really communicate with them, okay, that's the portfolio of services or products that you can use from us. Why would they care about what you created? Because you have good reasons if you build it, not because someone told you so, but they should care because you're compliant with your company's security policies, because you maintain something secure, because it's just easier for them to get it to work. But you need to make this communication really clear. It can go through documentation, examples. Maybe you will also manage the support and the updates of those artifacts and the services. Maybe you will provide consulting services. You may not call it like this because it's internal to your company, but if you have a customer and they want to have some customization or they want to have some, you know, they would like a new feature, you can think it's consulting services within your company. So basically you're using a cloud, in this case I used Azure as an example, and then that's a provider for you, the platform team. Then you have the platform, which is also the service that you're providing to the app team, which is Sarah's team that we discussed. Okay, so we have different elements, and then this is um, things that use at different layers. And what's really important here is to think about it as products and services, not projects. How can you define very quickly what a project is? Anyone? I like to say that a project is something that has a start date and an end date. You know, that's, that's how you see a project. If you create a product, it doesn't work like that. You have a life cycle. Maybe at some point you will tear it down, you will retire that product, and then it will be the end. But when you create something, you don't necessarily know when it starts. And then you're not looking at something, you look, you look at a full service and supporting a team. So you're actually creating a product or a service that you need to maintain and you need to evolve over time. And that's very important because then you will have competing priorities. Feature requests, supports, reliability, all of those. So let's look at Sarah. Sarah is, uh, Sarah is a person, so she's uh, probably working in, in the team that we discussed, the, uh, the app dev team. So those creating the accounting software that runs on the platform we provide. So we learned about Sarah, and one way to you know, really um, uh, describe Sarah is, well, we can create a persona using persona template, and I've sent you a link, very useful. Start talking about you know, the different people, different customers that you may have on use personas. Because when you have someone starting, or if you talk about um, the person consuming your services, you may have many internal customers, they have different needs. And it's much easier when you start by showing this. If there's a new need, then you can add it there, and you see that it was not in the plan originally. And when you have scope creep coming up, it's very good to see, oh, that's because it's a new need from that persona. And then you have different personas, and you will find they create value maybe in different ways. And if it's the CEO, maybe that has a higher priority. But it's easier to see when you have those different, um, you have those different personas. So the templates, very important. Use personas. Don't just say, yeah, this person or that person or that team. Be specific, write it down, making it visible for everyone to see. Put a picture, a name, and, and develop the empathy you have for your users. Picture name, yeah, details, behavior. So some will be, and that's another thing we're gonna get into, some are more reluctant to change or to technology. Put that here because that's important. When you pick which, which customer, maybe you have a new um, image or a new automation system, if that's a reluctant person to try new things, probably that's not your best first customer. So we will see you know, what to think about this uh, in a bit. And uh, obviously, very, very important, what problem and what goals do these, these people have? So the platform service. Um, okay, so I already mentioned there's no start and stop date for the service. We create something. It's a product on the associated services. Don't think about, yeah, I created the script, the automation, the system, the pipeline, I'm done. That doesn't work like this. How do you use it? How do you onboard your customers? This, when you define the project, is very important. And if you spend three days or three weeks creating something, how many have you planned to train your customers, <coughs> internal customers? How, ma how many days have you planned to train them? What's the onboarding process? Have you thought that through? 
And that means maybe when you design it, you should already onboard them at the very beginning. And Sarah is one customer, but maybe there's more than one customer in your company, internal customers that would use your services. Again, how do you see which one is the priority? How do you uh, start a domino effect? You know, if Sarah is using it, maybe another team says, oh, I like what you're using there. Let me try the same thing, and they will contact your team. So all of this is just the start to be able to see the value chain. Remember I said what's really important is the business value that exists in your company. And basically we saw there's a customer, and the customer has needs, and then there's a product or service that is meant to answer those needs. And that's the value that we're looking for. But as we saw, it's not usually direct. So we have the end customers of the business, and then they've got some needs, and we provide maybe with an accounting system. But that's one in turn, that's the very high level needs, but in turn, we need to have the web app, which is talking to some you know, identity and access management. We need to have the web servers <coughs> running the accounting web app, object storage, and then we get into the technology and the different elements that the platform team is managing. The accounting web app is done by Sarah's team, as we've seen earlier. All right? So Sarah's team needs to be running things from the platform team, even if we're not the direct um, a provider for the customer, we're still in the value chain. The value chain is going, if you want, one way or another. The value is coming from the bottom there, and it's build up, build up, build up, up it to it answer the customer's need. So you're still part of the value chain. And the value chain is very, very useful to be able to communicate around. You know, you have only one customer here, but most likely when you provide IT services, you have many, many, many customers in your, um, in your organization. Finding all of those verticals, all of those value chains, will tell you, uh, which will, will make you very easier for you to say that has priority over that one. You know, for instance, that's what you sell to this customer. So that means if you don't sell, if there's an outage, probably it's gonna be quite expensive. If you have some <coughs> compliance requirements for a compliance authority, depending on your line of business, either it's very, very important, maybe even more important than, uh, than your customer, or maybe it's not that important and can wait a little bit. So that's how you can define the priorities. But if you don't understand the different customers that you have, then it's gonna be hard to manage the priorities. And I won't go into the details because uh, Chris Hunt actually created, uh, did um, a talk in PS Summit, I can't remember the year now, with uh, COVID and everything, but uh, I think it was around 2018 about uh, uh, wildly maps. That's the very beginning that you start doing for wildly mapping. Wildly mapping is a good way to have strategy about where you need to build in-house, what you need to buy, but that's just the beginning. So what if um, you have other, other components? You see, you have all the uh, requirements for this user but not all of the, which one is the top priority and which one is. So that's the value chain. Very important, and I recommend you doing it in your company every time. It may be something that your manager needs to do. Maybe uh, if you onboard someone, and you show them that. It's not about the org chart. In many, many companies, uh, after I say, hey, can you show me the org chart? And then I ask, okay, can we design this together? And I say, okay, you see, there's the org chart, which is the teams and the people working on the teams, and that's the value chain, and there's no correlations between those, or it's very hard to find the correlations. That's what's important. So if you do something, make sure you understand what is the value stream you're working in. And when we have this, then we can think about as well the silos and queues. You know, we've heard about DevOps, it's really bad about, you know, uh, between the dev team and the ops team, we create a wall in between there. What, you know, it's bad. We know it's bad, but why is it bad? We create an interface between two teams. When we have the value chain here, there's a wall in between. And when you have an interface, that means there's a queue. If she wants something done, it goes usually in a ticket queue, right? That means you create delays. You have issues with prioritization, alignment. You have more than one customer, so which one is the most important? <coughs> if you have queue, you have delay. You know, she sent a request, I'm busy with something else, I'm on the phone, it's gonna take me some time before I can get to the point where I can, uh, I can address the problem. 
Um, there's also an issue where if you have horizontal silos, that means that's one silo, that's another silo, you are splitting the value stream horizontally. And you should try to be uh, very, like you should try to have the least amount of, um, of slice in one vertical. So when you create one value stream, make sure it's the quickest. So then if the customer wants something, you can very quickly iterate through the products and do something very quickly. Remember, that applies for external customer. It also applies within internal customers. And then uh, within a team, you see you have web server, VM, object storage. You can believe you're on the same team, and it looks great on paper. But object storage is done by uh, Raymond, as an example. And if he's on holiday, that's not going to get worked. So it's not because it's within the same team that you don't have this interface problem. That's the, in the Phoenix project, that's the Brent problem. He's always in the path of creating the value. So you don't want to have one guy, uh, you know, uh, the only guy doing this and the only guy doing the VMs. You know, you're creating work centers, which is like their own team of individual. You need to have overlaps, <coughs> enough overlaps so you don't have, you know, a deadlock. Otherwise, you're creating the same thing, a queue, which imposes delays on which is much harder for you to, um, to plan, if it, to plan uh, the work you're doing and to give good estimates because you always have to wait for that person to be available, but they may be already working for another project. So it's getting very, very difficult to plan and do things. So that's what silos are. Even within a team, you can have silos, and then if you split two teams like this, which sometimes you have to do, but bear in mind, you will create interface queues, and that will induce delays. Uh, in a matter of time, I'm probably going to be very quick with those. So pipelines and tests. Uh, so the, the release pipeline model about this, uh, there's a correlation. So um, we talk about pipelines as the conveyor belts. We create pipelines, but what's the point? Is it just testing? It's a bit more, uh, it, yes, it's about the testing. It's about building trust in the artifacts you create. But there's a reason for that. Uh, if you change in the object storage down there, Good. Is it used? It's only valuable when it's applied and used. So if you make a change, if you create a solution, you don't create value necessarily if it's not used. If you create a script, no one uses it, you spend a lot of time. You haven't created any value because it's not used. Remember that every time. Pipeline build trust in an artifact. So you create something new, a new object storage. The first question is, you know, does the new version work? And then you need to make sure you test it. So maybe replicate an environment and then test it. Does the rest work with it? And then you will try to integrate that test uh, with the, all the things that you in parallel. And when everything works, every element works together, the value is working, you're pretty confident, then you can release that finally in the, pro um, in the production process. And that is, at that point, you created the value for the business because it's in use. You can't say you created the value if you created a script that no one used. And it's again, it's about the business value. And then when you have optimization, I'm really going, so yeah. Okay, so um, optimization, how do you optimize things? So here we just looked a bit deeper into what the platform team does, you, the platform team um, looked after. So we have the web server, object storage, and then we looked a bit deeper at what happens in the VM. What's limiting you? Is it provisioning the new VM instances, changing the provisioning, changing the running systems? You know, what's all the improvements you can do to this? Are you firefighting Snowflake issues? And then you want maybe to improve those things, but then you realize that with the object storage, it's Raymond doing it. Raymond is always busy doing something else, and that takes you 14 hours to get one new object storage provisioned. The rest, creating the VM, it's probably taking you an hour when you know, you're doing everything about the VM, the security, the patching, everything. So you're trying to improve the VM, but what really takes the most of time is creating the object storage. So if that takes 14 hours and that takes uh, maybe less time, your, uh, your limit, your constraint is the object storage. So there's no point in trying to improve this while this is your constraint. Any improvement not made at a constraint in a zeal is an illusion, and that's coming from the Phoenix Project as well. I really recommend this book. So Theory of Constraints comes from uh, uh, Goldratt. Uh, the Goal is also another book very interesting for that, and that applies to us. Uh, probably last, 
Something very important is the technology adoption curve or the diffusion of innovation. When we try to create new technology, we induce change. And we think we create a new solution, but actually it's a bit more complex than just the solution itself. We need to deliver that solution to the users. And they need to say, well, I will use your, I will use your tool. And that's the idea is some people are keener to learn new technology, to try things. Even if it doesn't really work, they see, they're the innovators, they will see the value that the potential value that it has, and they will help <coughs> you deliver this. Some people will say, okay, like you started, it looks like it looks okay, maybe I will give it a try. Think about PowerShell 15 years ago. Some people say, oh, that looks cool. It's really buggy, oh, sorry. It's really buggy, but it looks cool. So they started doing it, and they started even doing conference about it. And you know, that's how some people do. And then after a while, people say, well, actually, you look, better, you look more productive than I am when you're using PowerShell. And that's maybe you know, the early majority here. They've seen you doing it, and they start, you know, they start thinking, ah, actually, I should probably give it a go. And there's those you know, still using uh, b uh, batch uh, files, maybe. And they say, ah, oh, I don't really want to move from my batch files or my VB scripts. But at some point, maybe they will do. So you have, and you see you've got that guy, I want my fax machine blank. You know? Some people you just can't do anything about. But when you create your tool, before you even start the implementation or the, uh, the development of your solution, think about this. And there's also a percentage, so you will see that, and this is the, there's a chasm here. And the point is, until you're over there, you're really not out of the woods. If you start uh, um, you know, just targeting the innovators and the early adopters, it, it, will not, it may die off before you even you know, got used everywhere. So make sure you start with the innovators because they will give you the feedback very quickly. They will try things even if it's a bit buggy. Then you can start with the early adopters and then you will have to keep pushing to get the early majority. Usually when you get to that point, it's much easier and then it will just roll out to some extent. A bit like what happened with PowerShell. At the beginning, yeah, PowerShell is cool. And then, you know, Modern Manifesto, even within Microsoft, they didn't believe it. And then kept pushing, kept pushing. Maybe, you know, PowerShell V1 was there. And then, you know, say, oh, actually, that's cool. Let's give it a try. And then uh, Exchange came up, and people started to use the Exchange, you know, PowerShell with Exchange. And this is where people were really uh, being productive, and they found, oh, that works. And then the rest of the community followed. All right, I have so much more slides, but you know, I knew that I would not get to the end. So if you have any question, let's do this, and then we can talk about value stream mapping maybe outside at, at another point. Any questions so far? Was it helpful? Yeah, okay. <laughs> There's a lot of things it's like, like it's very theory based, but uh, I do consulting and I help companies, and I help in two ways. So uh, obviously PowerShell, DSC, this kind of automation, but almost every time, you have an impact with the technology, but you're not going to be able to have that much of an impact compared to changing the process and the thinking process you're doing around this. Implementing an agile workflow, like I really, I'm a Scrum guy, I, I really like implementing Scrum, not the things by the book, just enough for you to get started, understand how to work with the iterations. Whether you want to use Kanban, that's fine. Usually I do a little bit of mi a mix of those two. But um, think about it, learn, read books, understand why people are talking about it. The Phoenix Project is the book for you to get a very quick overview of all of this in a very simple way. And then you know you have the drawers, you know where to look for more information, or the books, or the, uh, or the talks, and things like this. If you've seen April's uh, keynote, she went a thousand miles an hour with lots of items which are really important, and you can deep dive into it. I just maybe looked into a more depth into three or four of those right now. So that's how you manage you know, better priorities and better understanding of the organization, how you will deliver the business. And if you're writing automation and solutions, that's what make it work. It's not just writing the script. Obviously, you need to write it and to test it, but also all of those things. So when you plan it, when you plan your project, not project, your product, but then think about this. Thank you very much. More questions? No? Am I too early? If I'm too early, I can go to that one. Yeah.
if you want to, if you want to leave, I won't be offended. Otherwise, we can go to. Uh, so this is value stream mapping. So the idea here is, um, uh, it's the extra. I might not be able to get to the end because there's a lot of content, but that's the idea. You know, you're you're working in a support request type of thing, and then you get an email and say, hey, I want you know those VMs created for me. Uh, so you're busy. You're doing something else. You know, the request coming in the ticketing system. You know, Monday you were busy firefighting. Uh, it's, uh, it's Tuesday, you're not going to look at the ticket today. You received it, you know, 3, uh, you, you received it, you know, 3.30 p.m. Okay, it was on the queue, you left it there. And then, Wednesday morning, you come, okay, I'm ready, I'll look at the queue, you know, I'll check my emails, look at the queue. 9 a.m., I'm going to start on the task. It's been 17 hours and 30 minutes already waiting within your queue. No biggie, maybe, maybe not. And then you start working on it. The first thing is, you know, network configuration. It takes you 10 minutes to do it. 10 minutes to do it. Pretty easy. And then you have to create the VM. So spin up the VM maybe in your vSphere environment. You know, that's not a long time, but you know, you had a stand up before that, so it waits another 20 minutes. Then it takes you, you know, 15 minutes to spin it up, maybe because you couldn't find the template, and then you just have to find the thing. I don't know, right click, start. Let's say you've done that. And then you do, you know, pre-stage it in AD to make sure that, uh, you know, when you have the build process, it does that. Um, but before you can even get to work on this, when it's there, it's like, this is the waiting time. And this is the actual hands-on time when you do something. So AD pre-stage, you know, you go in your AD forest, maybe you're just running a script. It just takes, you know, let's say five minutes, maybe less, but it's there. And then you need to do the OS deployment. You know, you have a coffee, five minutes probably more for me, uh, but then you start the OS deployment and that takes four hours because Windows update, obviously. <laughs> so now we've got the, the time where we've, uh, we're there. So uh, 2.55 p.m. on the Wednesday. You leave it there because you know it takes four hours. You're not gonna sit and look at it for four hours. And then when it's finished, you're already working on something else. So. You wait for Thursday morning when you start your day, and that's been 20, 21 hours and five minutes, just waiting there. And then um, for the OS configuration, uh, you go the old way. I used to do that many, many years ago, when you have this very big Word document with step one. Go in this thing. You've been there, right? <laughs> I can see people like twitching. Yes, we've been there. And then finally, you can do the web server install. Uh, after two hours, you get the person ready to do that. Raymond was busy with a, another meeting, so then he can start doing the configuration. That takes maybe another two hours. You know, it's a bad scenario, but you know, I've, I've lived that, so I know it's true. Um, so after, so you finish pretty much just before uh, 5 p.m. on the Thursday, and then you say, hey, it's ready. You update the ticket. Yeah, it's ready. Obviously. Thursday, 5 p.m., the dev team is not going to look at it straight away, so they can't use it straight away. So it still sits there ready for them to use, so you've done your job, you know. Hands off, not my problem anymore, it's done. It's still sitting there 15 hours. So you can see that on Friday, 8 a.m., they actually have the package delivered to them, which they requested on Tuesday, 15 hours. You didn't spend necessarily that much time doing it, but then you can see how much time it was being busy and how much time it was just sitting doing nothing. Very useful. So the processing time is 11 hours and 30 minutes, but the hands on time was 7 hours and 45 minutes. Uh, the reason is uh, for, those, uh, for those four hours of the, um, of the deployment, you just spin it up and then Windows Update does its own thing, so you're not really hands on. It just happened to be kicked off by you, it takes 15 minutes, and then the rest of the time you're just doing its thing. So the lead time from there to there, 70 hours and 30 minutes. And you can see that, um, yeah, that part, maybe one hour is on, uh, on, on time, and then you can automate that maybe. You can make it slightly easier. So let's go next. So you, if you reduce that task to one hour, then you can reduce the hands-on time. Yes, I'm already done, actually. I'm just adding some more stuff. They haven't left, so I keep talking until they're starving, and then they will go. 
And then uh, if we reduce that uh, by automation, then we can also uh, reduce the processing time. So then we would deliver this at 1 p.m. on the Thursday. Not bad. Maybe if it's 1 p.m. on the Thursday, maybe they will be able to pick it up a bit earlier. So maybe they can get it you know, 1 p.m. on the Thursday. So we've already saved maybe half day by just saving a few hours there, four hours. Good. And we reduce the lead time from 70 hours to 51 hours and 30 minutes. Um, I'm just checking. Yeah, okay, so I'm go back, going back here. There's different, there's another option that you can do to improve the system. You see here, you have little bit of Amazon time, but a fair bit of Q here. Sorry. <coughs> so 10 minutes, 15 minutes, five minutes, four hour, uh, sorry, yeah, no, not even that one, just the kickoff of this one. So that's not much. But you can save, uh, let's say you are, don't have to wait, you can uh, save 45 minutes here. So if we reduce the hands-on time from just, so we just reduce 45, minute, 45 minutes here, the processing time uh, is reduced as well. But then what happens is we change the queue because we remove all this waiting time in between. We've only improved that, so then there's no manual interaction. It just starts here. You do something maybe for 45 minutes, and then it just goes through this. So you remove all of this waiting time not doing nothing. You remove the cues. And then you've improved all of those things, and then you improve the delivery time and the lead time a lot more. So you have this option to improve, or you have this option to improve. Which one will you choose? So one will improve the time you have on Zon, and the other one will t improve the time uh, for delivery to your team. So the business value will be uh, delivered quicker if you improve here, but then your team will have less you know, hands-on time if you automate this process. So then the question is, do you prefer saving time for your team or creating value for your business? And it's easy for you to say that, but you know, think about your business. And, and this, you know, there's no right solution. The, the real question, oops, sorry. The real question is, do you want a tactical, a tactical approach or do you want a strategical approach? So it's tactics via strategy. But if you don't understand that, <coughs> then you're always looking at efficiency for your own team. But that doesn't mean you improving the business value creation for your company. And on that note, I'm already late, so I'm really sorry. Yeah. <laughs> This time probably I will finish. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> All right. <laughs>